Hello, welcome to the Friday, May 20th, 2022 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Got yet another great diary from Pratt today, and Pratt took a look at the malware that is using the Transfer XL service. Transfer XL is a legitimate file transfer service, but like so many similar services, it is often also being abused to transfer malware. And that's in particular what, of course, Pratt was looking into here, and he zoomed in on the Bumblebee malware that he looked at before. And a particular sample that Pratt ran into here is related to a threat group that Google calls Exotic Lillian has recently written up as in particular taking advantage services like TransferNow, TransferXL, WeTransfer, OneDrive, and of course, other similar services. In the sample that Pratt looked at, uh, the malware that's being downloaded uh, from TransferXL is arriving as a zip file. Once you extract it, we have yet another ISO file, which uh, then when you double click it, actually does the good old shortcut trick to then run a hidden DLL. And that's when Pratt first saw the Bumblebee command control traffic and then later Cobalt Strike. Strike. As usual, Pratt gives you access uh, to packet captures, indicators of compromise, and lots of other details related to this particular infection. And Microsoft today released an out-of-band update not to fix a new security vulnerability, but to address an issue that cropped up uh, with uh, the May patch Tuesday update. Uh, one particular problem here was that people experienced authentication issues with Active Directory, and this new patch now fixes uh, these problems. This is important because organizations have delayed rolling out the update, and this uh, problem affected in particular the fix for CVE 2022-26923, which was the 30 fright issue that uh, we have an active exploit available for. CISA, I believe, initially had this sort of as their must-patch updates, as their sort of actively exploited uh, vulnerability list items, but they removed it because of uh, these authentication issues. Now with this fix, hopefully you're able to apply the full May update. And then we got updates from SonicWall for the SMA 1000 uh, series uh, products that fix an arbitrary code execution issue. However, in order to exploit this vulnerability, you have to be logged in as a user. The reason this is still important is that the code will execute as root. So you have a Pretty nice uh, privilege escalation vulnerability here. And uh, this could also be exploited as a denial of service attack. And network storage company QNAP is reporting that they are yet again seeing the deadbolt ransomware taking out uh, devices. And now, this appears to be now almost sort of a monthly announcement by QNAP. And what it always comes down to is, number one, do not expose the admin interface to the world and the ransomware folks. And secondly, keep your systems up to date. These attacks do not appear to be exploiting any new vulnerabilities. Instead, they're just counting on out-of-date devices being exposed and easy prey for their attacks. And something else you definitely should not expose to the internet is your Kubernetes API servers. Apparently, there are not a lot of Kubernetes folks that are listening to my podcast. Maybe we need more of them because according to a scan done by the Shadow Server Foundation, there are 380,000 open Kubernetes API servers that they were able to detect. Now, they just checked if a specific URL were accessible, pointing to them actually acting as Kubernetes API servers. Of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are vulnerable, but just having them accessible is probably already too much. 
Well, then, want to do your own internet-wide scan, scanning for vulnerabilities. There are maybe now one less thing you have to worry about. The U.S. Department of Justice today announced that they are revising their policy and they will no longer prosecute what they are considering good faith security research under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. But note that this is not a change in the law. This is just a change in U.S. Department of Justice policy. Prosecutors typically have uh, some leeway in what they're going to prosecute and what they're not going to prosecute. So I wouldn't go ahead and try to run a pen test on your bank quite yet. Also, of course, depends on what exactly is considered a good faith security research. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.